Eso ya ni hablamos, ¿no? En Barcelona ni hablamos. What's going on? It happens. Happens. Okay. Hello. Anyway, uh, we we'll start again. Take two. Flap. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this session in the Sun Nutrition Hub. I'm delighted to be here. My name is David Navarro. Welcome. Uh, we are having an event today that is webcast, so the microphone matters. Uh, we have a very good opportunity today to have an information session about a new initiative called the Food Systems Dialogues. Uh, we will have some introductory remarks from the three initiating organisations that have come behind the Food Systems Dialogues. But to help us get going, uh, I'd like to invite Khadava Berg, the coordinator of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement and the Secretary, Assistant Secretary General in the United Nations to say some introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, and to all of you, dear friends, because uh, normally at events you start with your excellencies, uh, d distinguished delegates, but this is the fourth days of day of uh, activities in our nutrition hub. And um, we start now our meeting with dear friends. Tonight, we have a new topic on the agenda. We have dealt with several topics, but tonight we are dealing with a crucial when it comes to healthy diet and good nutrition, which is food system. And I have to admit that in the Sun Movement, uh, until now, we do not pay enough attention to rethinking and redesigning and redeveloping food systems. And I do not mean only agriculture. I do mean the whole uh, value chain uh, from production to consumption. So we are proud to uh, host this event uh, uh, this evening. We are very uh, happy to see delegations also from Sun Movement countries because as Sun Movement we are involved in the design and the development of the uh, food system dialogues because we think that in the end the the um, um, investment and uh, implementation has to be done country owned and country driven. Um, owned by the government with involvement of all different sectors that we cover in the Sun Movement, uh, private sector, civil society, um, uh, maybe also donors and uh, of course also the UN, but also research and know-how people, etc. We need all of them to rethink, but um, 
um, uh, also very important to implement these uh, systems. So I'm curious uh, to um, uh, be here in this uh, information uh, session, and we are involved, and we will. We are very motivated to uh, contribute and to stay involved because it's in the uh, interest of Sun Movement countries and Sun Movement people. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Oh. For, thank you very much for enabling us to use this space and also for showing us that for the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, food systems and food system dialogues are key. Now we have three opening panellists who will help us on our way and I'm going to invite the three to come and sit on the three chairs here on the right and I'd like to invite Gunhild Stordalen the President and CEO of the of EAT to come and sit here. I'd like to invite Peter Backer, President and CEO of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, and Sean DeClean, Director of the Food Systems Programme at the World Economic Forum. We are going to invite our panellists to give short opening remarks about why, in their view, dialogues about food systems and the way they need to evolve are so important. Uh, Gunhild Stordalen has another really important engagement to go to and she will only stay for a little bit. Her colleague uh, who's sitting in front here who's on the EAT board, Dr. Usman Mustak, uh, will uh, come in but Dr. Gunhild Stordalen, you have the floor now to give us your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh Thanks for being here. Uh, this, uh, or the topics of food, health, and sustainability uh, are like the three musketeers, one for all and all for one. And we cannot tackle one without dealing with the others. Still, these issues have been traditionally handled in silos, and it has not been any mechanism to bring the science together or any global mechanism or entity overseeing all the food related challenges and uh, my organization eat was actually started on that question how to feed close to 10 billion people a healthy diet without destroying the planet along the way and when I realized that there was no sound science around these issues um, there was no report assessing all the existing evidence and there's no IPCC for food systems uh, and, and without finding these answers it's hard to mobilize global action towards a joint vision and without science-based targets it's hard to to actually have an, the, the right evidence base. So as an initial attempt, uh, together with the Medical Journal de Lancet, it set up this Eat Lancet Commission to review and assess the existing evidence and set the first, the first or the initial scientific targets on what a food system that uh, support the 2030 agenda and also help us achieve the Paris Climate Agreement will have to look like. Obviously, the Eat Lancet Commission is just uh, an initial effort, much more evidence will be needed, much more research will have to be done, but it's a start. But on the other hand, on bringing together all these now initiatives popping up in the, in the food system space, there are so many things happening, which is great. More and more stakeholders are realizing that the only way forward is actually a food systems approach. Uh, so this initiative coming out of the World Economic Forum, World Business Council and EAT is obviously uh, still very much work in progress and an initiative to, to start a dialogue taking on this holistic perspective in an in inclusive way involving sectors and disciplines and not at least all across borders uh, to bring together the stakeholders that are needed to take part in this grand uh, transformation of the food system that we will have to see. So what these food systems dialogues will actually uh, be, that will be very much uh, up to, uh, to the next couple of steps. And obviously we, we would like to see as many as possible joining uh, this and, and really shape it as we go. But 
in order for us to, to achieve this transformation, we will have to see global, so uh, from the global level to the regional and the national and even down to the city level and breaking down the silos within governments across the sectors and, and across the disciplines. So we are very excited about announcing this here today and I will give the word then to the other two uh, core uh, curating partners. David. Thank you very much, Thank you very much, Thank you. <laughs> If I could just add a couple of words of real, uh, real positive reflection of what EAT has done in the last five years. Uh, Gunhild herself wouldn't say this, but I'd like to tell you that, in my opinion, on the international stage, as well as at regional level, EAT has helped large numbers of individuals and organisations appreciate much more the relationships between agriculture, food, climate, nutrition and health than was the case beforehand. So often when there is a shift in thought, we think, oh, how obvious. But then when we put ourselves back to the time before that thought shift happens, we can remember perhaps how disconnected things were. And as somebody who's had the opportunity to work with EAT, I would like to share with you my view that they've had a powerful impact on bringing these issues together, thanks to the leadership of Dr. Gunhild Stordan. So thank you, and I know you have to go, so we shall be super understanding when you slip out. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce you, uh, Dr. Uh, to introduce you Peter Backer who I've also known for, for years and who has become a kind of elder brother to me. Uh, he has, <laughs> just said that to wind him up, uh, he, has, he has really had an extraordinary impact on the way in which business is coming together to work for sustainable development, helping to show the way and one of the areas he's taken a particular interest in has been the way in which business can contribute to food systems that are fully sustainable in line with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Peter, could you give us your reflections on why you think these dialogues are so important? Yes, thank you. I, sh I should probably start by saying your excellencies and dear delegates. Yeah, you should because when your middle name is business, dear friends might be uh, an interesting opening line. So I won't go there. Gerda, thank you for, uh, for hosting us in this amazing room. Um, I think for me, this particular journey started, and I never ever disagree with my younger brother, <laughs> as one does, but this time I do, because we're not here to launch a new initiative. Our, our view of this space is, there are too many initiatives, and we don't allow them to talk to each other. And the people who are in, in the many different initiatives, even when they speak to each other, often basic levels of trust are not in the room. And so this food system dialogue, in our opinion, is really about bringing different actors from around the food system together to exchange lessons, to introduce initiatives, to hopefully over time build a common agenda and create the transformation that we, we all know the, the system needs to feed 10 billion people within the boundaries of a planet with diets that are healthy. Um, so we started this journey uh, pretty much around the time that the SDGs were formed and at, in those same months the Paris Agreement was achieved and if you look at the Paris Agreement four things kind of struck us the first thing is there was this meeting in Paris and and of course there were many cops before the one in Paris but thousands of people national government civil society city mayors business leaders joined and had dialogues about this issue 
Science was really clear on climate. Trust between stakeholders had been built enough to have conversations with each other, and solutions were increasingly available, and that's normally where business can, can play a useful role. We then looked at, well, if you put that on the food challenge, where do we go meet? What is the science actually telling us? Do we have trust between the stakeholders? And are there solutions which are scalable enough to have the impact that I guess all of us in this room desire them to have? And the answer to all four questions was no, it's not. So Eat Lancet is doing amazing work. Fable and others are doing fantastic work to create the science. Um, the, the business solutions in WBCSD and in, in elements in the World Economic Forum are beginning to gain real momentum. But so far we haven't found the place to have the dialogue. So two years ago, I think uh, Gunilt, myself, Klaus Schwab in the World Economic Forum, we had a meeting as, why don't we begin to think about how do we do this? We've had many consultations. The, the conversation tonight with all of you is, is part of that. And if all goes well, three weeks from now, Stockholm during the EAT Forum, the first of the dialogues will happen. It, in my mind, can only work if it's a totally neutral, open space where any initiative from any stakeholder can be brought in, where the relevant science gets put on the table, where the, all the relevant policymakers international and national are in the room, where business can show what, what are actually the solutions, the technologies, the, whatever it may be that are available, and then jointly build this vision and the action around what is the transformation and how can we do it at the best possible pace. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Peter. Thanks very much indeed. Stressing that his commitment and the commitment of his organization is very much to all the different actors feeling that there is space where they can lean forward and work together to shift food systems so that they are more sustainable. It uh, sounds remarkably simple and yet Actually, there are very few spaces in the world today where that kind of open dialogue is possible. And so, Sean de Clean of the World Economic Forum, previously working with AGRA, the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Af Africa, and previous, previously in a number of other roles in the public sector and in the private sector, is the third organizational representative who's come behind the dialogues. Sean, what's your vision of how the dialogues might be conducted and where they might get to? Thanks, David. So, I mean, we are at the World Economic Forum. I think when this, I only started six months ago and this idea was presented to me on day one when I joined. And I must admit, I was tremendously excited by uh, this because I think the food system is probably going to be one of the most complex challenges we undertake. It cuts across every sector. If you talk to people in health, they will tell you the biggest health outcomes they're seeing are related to dietary shifts. You know, if you look at the impact on climate change, uh, you know, at the moment it's already uh, agriculture and land use represents 30% if energy and transport achieve their targets over the next 10 or 15 years and agriculture remains the same, you're talking about 60% of uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions you know, coming from that sector. So you know, these are major cross-cutting threats. Nutrition, which is why you're here, you know, this is a major you know, sort of agenda where it's really looking at the whole relationship with, uh, with value chains and how they operate and how you look at nutrition at a much broader aspect. So it's a very challenging space. And as people said, there hasn't been a common understanding of what we mean by food systems. And so this idea to take a red thread through a number of, so that the dialogues aren't creating a whole new 
agenda on their own. They're basically linking in with a whole series of other existing agendas, like this one, you know, where this is being introduced, to take forward a common conversation, to build up a series of connected systems leaders, food systems leaders who are talking around a common agenda. It is going to be a disruptive space. We are not, you know, food is a very emotional area. You know, there are very different viewpoints in different parts of the world. And, and so it will challenge the way that we, we think about this. And we're going, we need that space where there is this common red thread being taken through different events, but allowing for some of those different voices to come in. For local voices to come in. This could very easily just be something that is held at the international level amongst international institutions where you're engaging UN institutions, organisations like the Committee on Food Security, Sun, you know, a range of international players. But actually a lot of these dialogues need to happen at the local level. So we've already had strong asks from you know, the, from one of the main farmer organisations in India to say we would like to follow through on, you know, this kind of food system dialogue and link it into this common red thread agenda. We've had a similar one from Africa where, you know, uh, AGRA were saying they would like to, you know, work with this. Sun have been saying they would like to look at introducing this into the country piece of this because I think... There was a point made right at the beginning by Goethe, which was, this has to be country-led. I mean, these dialogues as well have to have a strong country voice. You know, a food system in China will be very different to a food system in East Africa, you know, which will be again very different to a food system somewhere in Europe. And so what does that mean in terms of creating that common framework? The other thing I think that we realise, which I can say, which is harder for David to say, is we realise that these dialogues needed to be curated. And we needed to have a strong, independent curator who would follow through. And so David Nabarro has very ably stepped into that role. So he's not just playing his very good moderator role as he does at events like this, but he is looking at the whole role of how would you curate and independently curate these dialogues and how would you build a network of curators around that that will follow through on that. And so that idea of systems leadership, of a red thread, of local voices being linked into international voices to create a common dialogue you know, for disruptive dialogues to be brought together to try and find a common agenda to link it to things like economic agendas, science-based targets, the role of innovation as it's taken to scale and plays a positive or negative disruption, and, and how we evaluate all of those to make sure that this is being inclusive and inclusivity will be a major part of this agenda is key. And so from our perspective, we are very excited from the forum um, because it represents that, you know, that, that really challenging area of alignment and cohesion uh, through that is represented through the Food Systems Dialogues to be part of this. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Good. So, here we have had, here we've had the introduction. Now I'm going to try an experiment. Um, I'm going to suggest we... Ought we take a decision to change the layout of the room? <laughs> and I'm going to suggest that we take our chairs and we go all round the outside of the room when we make a very big circle. Are you up to doing that? So we will start as we mean to go on.
we should just pile them up. Can each part, any extra chairs put back? Not to mess up the electricity. Sorry? If you can help with that, that'd be great. Can you say space matters? Hello, welcome. Thank you for coming. David, I'm not going to show the slide. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, now, we've got two rows here. Yeah. But you'll probably find a spare chair. Well, you... No, it's up to you. Where you feel comfortable. one centimeter more, not to touch. Okay, well, perfect. Yeah. Mon ami, on peut avoir, s'il vous plaît. Good. Ça va? Okay, ça va. Oui, oui parce que nous avons tous les... Okay, Merci the chair beaucoup. There. Désolé pour le... Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Could we have uh, more people up that end? Anybody want to go? We've got a few more people can fit in there. So you can always be assured if you come to an event moderated by David that it's never going to be business as usual. Ha <laughs> 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 ha. Brenda, come and sit next to me. Okay. This side. Thank you. Sorry about that. Further, will you come and sit up near yeah, here somewhere? Okay. Not tonight. Not tonight, David, she says. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. So, what I'd like to do now is to talk to you a little bit about how we're going to try to set up an opportunity for people to talk with each other about food systems and to try to find ways to work together to get them better. And actually, David, if you don't mind, David Diaz, yeah. if you could just put up slide five. That's the one I want up. And it, um, but I'm going to have it there really just as a placeholder. But I want to start sharing with you something that has become increasingly clear to me, which is that actually what we want from food systems is that they help people to be in good nutrition and to be healthy and provide safe and affordable food. But we also want them to actually look after the environment, not to empty out water from the aquifers so that people suffer from a lack of water, as in South Africa. We want them to promote biodiversity and not to contribute to species loss. We want them to help with climate change because 35% of greenhouse gas emissions are associated with food and land use changes. And we want them, we want food systems. Carlos, a problem? It's just the translation is a bit disturbing. Okay. Well, Carlos, come here. Come on, get here. Carlos, like me, he has bad hearing. I know him very well. We want our food systems not to be contributing to greenhouse gas emissions and to be helping people to cope with climate change and to adapt. And we would like food systems to create employment, particularly for people in rural areas. And we would like the employment conditions for women who work in food systems to be a lot better. And why is it so important? Because more than two and a half billion people have livelihoods that depend on food systems and because seven billion people and more depend on food systems for their nourishment and health. It's the most enormous challenge. And yet all the evidence suggests that the world's food systems are not working as they should. And I'm talking about food systems very broadly. Fishing, livestock, crops, 
horticulture, of course, and all other activities that are associated with food or that enable people to access food. And that's why we use the term system. And you know, despite efforts over the last few decades to get food systems to come right, all the evidence suggests that there is still a long way to go. And, and why is it so difficult? Well, in my experience, a lot of it is to do with lack of agreement between governments, among stakeholders within countries, among different groups who are active in food systems. And that disagreement is often so serious that it actually paralyzes action. And the Sun Movement is such a wonderful creation because it has created a space within which people, particularly in countries, can work together, as our colleagues from Madagascar told me just now, on a multi-stakeholder approach to nutrition that brings together all the different sectors. Well, if the Sun Movement can do that for nutrition, can't we do something similar, but on a bigger scale, for food systems? And we decided that the first thing we have to do about it is to create space where people can talk safely about their different positions and look for ways to find solutions. The alternative is disagreement, polarisation, which in turn actually leads to things not progressing. And the consequence is food systems that do not promote nutrition, do not promote health, do not promote biodiversity, do not contribute to greenhouse gas emissions being reduced. And that would be a disaster for the Sustainable Development Agenda. Now, within the dialogues, we see that we need to focus initially on three different areas. Policies and incentives, science-based targets and pathways, and then ways to get inclusion and innovation that works for food systems to come right. But the dialogues at the beginning will be super open, open to anybody to discuss any issue. Gradually we will try to help to nudge the dialogues so that we can focus on some of the most challenging issues that need attention. The dialogues are going to be initiated at the EAT Forum, the Stockholm Food Forum, on June the 13th, starting at 8 in the morning through till 1 o'clock. And there will be space for table conversations of about 12 people per table, and these people will be able to have their discussions moderated and recorded. And then as the dialogues progress in other locations as well, we will build up an overall understanding of what the areas of agreement seem to be and where there are major disagreements. Now, feeding into the dialogues, we hope that many different organisations will bring their perspectives coalitions that have brought together public and private actors, movements like the Scale Up Nutrition Movement, or the movements for reducing food waste and loss. We hope that representatives of farmers will be there, particularly smallholder farmers. We hope that the consumer movement will participate, expressing concerns, yes, but also identifying, as we saw in the Access to Nutrition Index recently, areas where there have been progress. Because the dialogues 
as well as identifying difference of opinion, should also be helping us to find where things are starting to come together. And that will then feed in to the Committee on Food Security, or feed in to the Food and Agriculture Organization or the World Health Organization, or feed in to the United Nations General Assembly, but also feed in to discussions at national level and local level. Because once new areas of agreement have been identified, it's much easier to get progress. Think about what happened when the world started to understand that non-communicable diseases pose an enormous threat to the future of humanity. It came about three years ago when information about the rising levels of diabetes and cardiovascular disease began to surface in epidemiological literature. And it started to feed through into WHO and then into the UN General Assembly, but has also become really important in national policies. Once it was clear that NCDs were a problem, and there was a greater agreement that a systems approach is needed to address that problem, it has led to a big shift in the kinds of programs that are being pursued, and it's also influenced the work of groups like the Movement for Scaling Up Nutrition. So it is that kind of improvement in agreement, levels of agreement and alignment that we're working for in the dialogues. Just lastly now, a little bit upon, on, on organisation. There are three major groups that have initiated the dialogues, and that's the World Economic Forum, the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, and EAT. But they don't want to control the dialogues. I've said that I'm happy to be the curator, but I want to be enabled to do this independently, because I want these dialogues to truly be open to all opinions. I want people to be able to come into a discussion without being frightened that they will be somehow made to feel wrong. I want people from all nations to be able to participate. And I want people to be able to contribute in the knowledge that what they say is being heard and listened to. Now that's going to be very complicated, but we're going to try. And so we'll have a beginning phase in the coming months to try to help us find the right way to do this. And we won't just have dialogues at global meetings. We'll also see we can find ways to have dialogues in regions and then to encourage dialogues in countries. Of course, it won't be always the same team doing it, but we'll offer materials and ideas for doing it and we'll offer a website so that the reports from the dialogues can be posted and everybody else can see what's going on. But your name won't be there saying X said Y. It won't be attributed to you. The reports will be done in the, what's called the Chatham House way, which means that whatever you say does not get stuck to your name. And that helps people to feel that they can say what's important. Of course, if they insist on their name being there, that's possible and sometimes that's necessary. Lastly, there is a, a steering group, as I said, of the three organisations, but they're supported by a reference group, which is a group that at the moment is uh, one that people can just volunteer to join, where if they want to try to influence the shape of the dialogues, they can do so through regular teleconferences. We'll be limited by practical details soon as to how many can be on the reference group, but if you are keen to try to influence this process, you obviously are interested because you've come here to this session, please do let us know and we'll try and find a way to make sure 
that you can join the teleconferences where we discuss what the dialogues will do. So, first dialogues, June the 13th, at the Stockholm Food Forum. Opportunity to contribute through the reference group. Proposed uh, or anticipated measures of success will be if we can show there is a greater measure of agreement on how to make food systems nutritious, good for ecosystems, good for climate, and good for rural development, especially for women. So those are some remarks, and now what I'd like to do is just to invite you to just share your thoughts about this, any thoughts you've got. Uh, I will um, encourage perhaps three or four comments, and then I will, if you've got a comment that is relevant for one of our panellists, I will make sure that happens. If you need to run off quickly, please uh, do uh, make sure you've said what you want to say. If you don't mind speaking into a microphone because we are being recorded, uh, that's useful. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, please say so and we will stop the recording. And bear in mind that you have a chance to influence this process because we have still not worked out precisely how to do it. That's why we're having this open session today. And by the way, if you work for the Sun Movement or if you work for any of the other organisations, don't be shy. Please participate as well. This is a truly open moment. Would anybody like to have a go? Anybody like to start the comments? I've got some reserve ideas if nobody wants to say anything because there are people I know here and I can look at them and say, have you got any comments? They can always say no. But I'll wait a bit. They say often when you're waiting for people to start talking, it's good to just have a good silence and not to fill it. So I'm now going to just be quiet and see who would like to start. Put your hand up and you'll get a microphone. Please. If you want to say your name, do. If you don't, it doesn't matter. My name is Lindsay. Um, I guess when we're talking about this, it sounds very interesting, but we're also talking a lot about creating a safe space. And I thought maybe you could maybe give a bit more background on, like a safe space for who, particularly for people maybe who are viewing and aren't necessarily aware of some of the background or anything like that. The first thing about the safe space was what we found when the Committee on World Food Security was reformed in 2010, that real care had to be made to make sure that people who came from organisations that might be represented communities who don't normally come to UN meetings, to feel that if they spoke they would be listened to and respected. Uh, it meant also we had to be careful on language. And we're not always good on that in the international system. And so part of the safe space is trying to help people with different languages to feel that they, their linguistic differences will be uh, managed. We want people with different abilities to be able to take part, disabled as well as fully able. We want people who don't normally have an opportunity to travel to be able to get support for travel. That's not going to be easy, but we're going to try to make that happen. And I suppose most importantly of all, we want people to feel that if they speak, their words will be listened to and not disregarded. That's the current feeling about safe space. But again, I would like anybody here who's got views on what a safe space is like in this kind of setting to share their views as well. And I would be very pleased if anybody from the initiating organisations who wants to add, please to do so and not to hold back. Did you want to say any more about this? Because it's really my... Please. So we're going to try and get to a microphone. That's the only difficulty we have is the microphone. Thank you. Okay, so this is 
This is um, an unrelated comment to the safe space. I'm just looking at the right-hand comment there, David, and you could take deal with this what you will, but you've put, or someone has put, as innovations are applied within the food system, they should ensure that they are of value to and accepted by all of the people for who they are designed. I just think that's setting the bar very high. Because often when you introduce innovations, especially within something as complex as the food system, you often aren't really going to be able to ascertain how valuable they are. You're going to need to evaluate, monitor, some things work, some things don't. And you won't really know how they will be accepted by people until some time down the road. So I just think that's, I just would query how realistic that, but you might want to just tweak the phrasing on that, if, if, you, if, if you agree. Thank you very much indeed. This is why we wanted to have this moment. The, the piece on innovations there is slightly to deal with the fact that we are detected among some a sense that the innovations that are taking place in food systems are uh, often not seen to be of value to and sometimes may even undermine the livelihoods of uh, smallholders uh, who uh, really ought to be the primary beneficiary of such innovations. So that was slightly to stress that we do recognise that there is a real anxiety about innovations in food systems but we can certainly take note of your point that the early part of an innovation uh, may be a difficult part. Is that what your point you were trying to make? Yeah and I think that it's, there's a lot more people as um, recipients of innovations than smallholder farmers. You've got you know burgeoning urban populations, you've got all kinds of people so I think it's quite hard to, to, to generalise that's all. Thank you very much. And, uh, if we just go on and uh, as far as the microphone lets us try to buzz it along, that'd be great. And I'll try not to give answers. I'd just like to get comments now. Johnny Tinch. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, Jonathan from the uh, Sun Business Network. It would be really great to think about how do we learn from what's been going on in terms of the climate change dialogues. I was really taken by the comment from Gunild earlier about, you know, what would an IPCC look like for the food system? And I think thinking about today, who would have thought we would have 100 of the leading companies in the world making science-based targets around uh, climate change. So it would be really great if, in this food systems dialogue, we could point to a sector which had seen quite a lot of transformation in terms of the engagement of all actors, and going from businesses being a big part of the problem to being a key part of the solution. So it would be really great to understand from you how you could point to some of the successes in other sectors uh, to bring about uh, renewed uh, uh, change. Uh, that would be really helpful uh, as part of this. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Other comments? Yeah. Now, if you could just land the microphone over there somewhere and then we just pass it round to whoever wants to speak next. Thank you. Thanks. Just um, Marin from the Donor Network. Just to build on that, what Johnny just said, I think learning is really important, and, but I also wonder you mentioned smallholder farmers and um, local communities, and I wonder how we can include those and not just have dialogues at the, at the more global and regional level. There's a couple of examples from other sectors, from local dialogues, which would be really interesting to learn from. Thank you very much. Pass the microphone on to whoever wants to speak. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Lise. I'm a junior doctor in London. Um, I do a lot of work though with the Royal College of Child Health uh, and we do a lot of work on, on inequalities and, and that related to nutrition. I just kind of wanted to go back a tiny bit, sorry. Um, whenever I was reading there, oh sorry, I'm, apologies, I'm just nervous, there's a lot of people. <laughs> um, um, going, going back to, to reading there where it says accepted by all the people for who they are designed, my mind obviously went straight to you know the people that are going to be eating eating food in our countries and a lot of the work I do involves speaking with children and young people and their families about food and the food that they eat and they often find a lot of our communications to them of these dialogues that we have without them quite condescending they don't really take into account actually how they live their lives and um, a lot of the the mothers it's almost exclusively mothers we end up speaking with um, we were talking to about, you know, thinking about how to, to, to feed their children in, in a healthier way. 
they sort of looked at me like I was crazy and they said, well, I, I feed them what the food bank gives me or I feed them what's left over in a shop at the end of the day because it's cheap or it's free. And, and to them, the whole concept of trying to dictate what they were eating was just so beyond belief because it's so out of their control. So it would just be interesting to, to think with these dialogues how those people are either going to be included at the dialogue stage or I, I don't know if there's going to be like a testing stage for some of these innovations because I feel like not only are they the most vulnerable um, or certainly the most vulnerable people that I'm seeing in the populations I work with, um, but they're the ones that actually could have the most to benefit from, from true innovation. So, uh, thank you. I'm trying to stick with my role of not speaking until at least five people have spoken. Thank you. From the UN network. Uh, I want to pick up a little bit of what my last two speakers uh, have spoken about. And I'm, I think it's a great start to have uh, the food system dialogues at the level of the EAT Forum in Stockholm. But I'm also wondering how the voices of not just the policy makers or the business community, those who are strong voices and are able to communicate at that level, uh, how the voices of those will be included. In particular, I, I start talking about at the regional level, at uh, country level, most importantly at the farm level, uh, but also by the cons at the consumer level. And are there any thoughts in taking these dialogues further down to the community level to get a real good sense of how, uh, how, that, uh, how the food systems currently affect them and what they would like to see as a change? And along with that, I also, I mean, I, I'm just connecting that to the smallholder farmer uh, and, the, and the entire value chain of what they produce versus what they receive in the end how that would figure out in the dialogue, because there's a lot of uh, steps uh, that, uh, that come in play before the consumer gets the, uh, the final product to consume. So now, to, just to react very quickly, uh, it is intended that this dialogues approach will actually be something that can be picked up and taken forward at local level, at national level, regionally as well as globally. Uh, of course, that will take time and it will also require enabling policy makers who might be a bit nervous about this very open, discursive approach to thinking through the future, getting those policy makers on side and comfortable. So we're starting slowly and uh, I can promise you that it is really clear in our minds that national and local level is the key. We do have a plan for the first regional come national dialogue to be in India, organised by the leader of a farmers' organisation uh, in India, uh, probably in October. So that is definitely there. And my only other quick reaction is your point about real people's voices as opposed to imagined voices, super important. Uh, and it requires us to be clever enough to make certain that either there is a way to get the voices of the people who you talk to coming into this, or at least to get them reflected into this. And that's a very, very important part of the work we're proposing to do, the systems approach we're trying to take. I would just like to turn to Peter Bakker and to Sean DeClean and to Usman Mustak and ask if you'd like to make any comments so far. Peter. No, I was going to respond to uh, Jonathan. I, I think your question, we've, we are at the moment uh, writing the business case uh, as one speaks on what happened in the climate change space. So we all remember Copenhagen kind of got derailed, science got discredited, we came to Paris, science was recognized. Some of the, 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 the intense energy companies were still resisting it. Today we live in a world where science-based targets are set, where the task force for climate-related disclosures is out, where companies begin to change their names to remove the word oil out of it. And, and this journey we're now mapping, and what can we actually do if we if we transfer that onto the food system. And that's, in my mind, going to be the biggest <coughs> challenge for this dialogue. Because if only the food system was as simple as climate change, with as laughable as that 
comment is because there's nothing simple about climate change. But in climate change, we now have a two degrees target and a one and a half stretch degrees target. And okay, we all know what to aim for. Food systems aren't going to be that simple because it ranges from small old farmers to obesity and everything that, and some of the things that people have already said in between. So the balance that we need to find, which I don't think we found the formula for, so that's why we are inviting everybody to this table, is how do we, on the one hand, drive on a number of priority areas without shutting out the voices or the lessons that are important to learn? And we're gonna have to work hard to get that right. And again, everybody at the table, but somehow we need to be able to agree I think like a set of rolling priorities, you know, let's begin with three two degrees targets for food and then take the next three and the next three. Because if we're gonna try and fix the system in one go, we're probably not gonna fix anything. Thank you, Sean. Um, <clears throat> I was just trying to figure out <coughs> what to add, but actually I think the point I might make is around innovation. Um, We've been looking quite a bit at this around the whole notion of innovation with a purpose from the World Economic Forum perspective. And it's quite interesting in the agriculture space, there's a lot of innovation taking place at the production end of agriculture. Uh, so at the growing end, but to your point on the health side, what we're not seeing is necessarily a lot of innovation on the user or the consumer end of innovation for people to be able to, you know, have the kind of information that they need around you know specific diets or health outcomes that then also allows <coughs> sorry that information and to feed back to farming outcomes mm. uh, so that you know we're growing the right food <coughs> sorry that we're growing the right food in the right areas you know that you don't have food deserts that you know some of your issues you know that you were mentioning if it's a food bank only has this type of food available, you know, that this is being fed back into food lace, food loss and waste innovations. And I think what, this is going to be one of the very interesting spaces that we will go into is the whole alignment <coughs> around innovation uh, between health, nutrition, food, agriculture, you know, things like fisheries and, you know, global commons like how we use the oceans and that and and how we really use innovation in a in a much more open and smart way that is trustworthy, that is inclusive, that is sustainable. And so at the moment we're seeing a rush towards innovation, but I, I think the big question that will be asked is, you know, how to make that innovation you know, really fit for purpose. And I think within the food system, we have an amazing opportunity to harness some of those innovations, you know, as they go forward, because actually we're starting from a very low base. Uh -huh. If you look at innovation in medicine and the investment into innovation in medicine, it's 10 times more on any given year for the same sort of size of sector as it is for food. So there's a huge scope for positive innovation, but right. it's going to require really collectively leaning in to shape those innovations so that they are fit for purpose. Thank you. Osman Mustak, Dr. Osman Mustak, as I mentioned, is a neat uh, advisory board member. Uh, uh, Osman, if you have any comments. Thank you. Uh, just, I mean, I was reflecting on, on some of the comments made here, and I think one thing that is important to, to mention, and, uh, and it's been highlighted both by you, David, um, um, and and that is the the fragmentation of the current discussion doesn't allow for a direction for the various actors in the very complex food system uh, to move into that can create uh, um, holistic uh, address holistic issues that that we're talking about. Hence, one of the major drivers of this is hopefully this will allow to set some sort of direction, which the various actors w who are in the various silos that, that they're, I mean, either it's in climate or it's in health or it's in water or wh whatever, you know, different specific issues of the, of the food system that we're talking about, that it allows for a, a, a direction which also makes it easier um, uh, to, to, to make a concerted effort, uh, especially on the global level. And then secondly, I think one important thing to mention is the leadership of the cities. I think that's why Gunhill specifically mentioned uh, the importance of 
of, of involving city level uh, actors and, and our intention is, is quite clear that this effort has to be uh, uh, multi-leveled um, and the cities um, actually holds uh, one of the major keys to driving the food system um, transformation. So this volunteer effort um, um, is, is a sign of a positive, uh, I guess, frustration <laughs> on the fact that we have lacked the, the direction uh, for transforming the food system. And, and this is the way that we think we can able to contribute in that, uh, in that effort. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Let's go on now and get some other comments. I hope that Predator Berg, if she wants to speak, will catch my eye any time. We'll go on passing the microphone round. And we've got a microphone to Akhoda, please. Actually, I, I would like to. Um, yes. Because um, back to the discussion about smallholders, um, we, we should try to make clear that this food systems dialogue is meant for all countries and all levels, and yes. not only focusing on developing countries. Yeah. And in this way, it's very important to frame it as a contribution also, an important contribution to the implementation of Agenda 2030. And I think in, uh, in this case, we shouldn't only talk about uh, smallholder farmers, but uh, also about family farmers and maybe uh, about farmers in general as uh, the start of the food value chain. Yeah. Don't focus too much on uh, the start and only the end. What happens to food in between is also uh, very crucial. How can we avoid waste in a very smart, food uh, losses in a smart waste? What happens during the processing of, uh, of, uh, of food, etc. But also, and let me emphasize this because it might be one of the most uh, difficult things, how do we consumers, uh, uh, how do we get consumers uh, on board? Because because if there's not a demand, there will, no, there will not be a, a, a successful a production of good food. Because if companies cannot sell the, the, the uh, very healthy uh, and nutritious uh, food, um, they will go bankrupt or they will stop to produce this. So it's, it's, it's quite complicated. What I think it is, is smart is to indeed think about having the food uh, uh, systems dialogue at several levels. I am impressed by what the uh, C40, the cities, uh, can, are able to do. And big cities have a lot of traction. They are very well able to, um, to make things happen. And my dream, I'm a, I'm a girl of the rural area, I'm a farmer's daughter, but I see also opportunities in this food system dialogue to vitalize the relation between the urban area and the rural area. The uh, urban area who can dream about producing enough food within uh, the city. Uh, urban agriculture is very famous these days, but it won't be enough. Uh, for this. But if you could build a new uh, balanced relation between the urban area and the rural area by uh, starting the discussion, how do we feed ourselves? How do we feed ourselves right now, but also within 20, 30, 40 years in a nutritious, but also in a sustainable and durable way? You're talking, you're talking real business and you're talking about people. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to invite if, if she wants, as well as the people who are holding mics at the moment. Uh, I don't know whether, Stineker, you are inclined to say a word a bit later. I hope, uh, if so, in a minute. John Atkinson, if you're John, inclined, you've John got a Atkinson. microphone. This uh, is John Atkinson, who's a, uh, systems, <coughs> a, a systems thinker and trainer. Uh, so, an experience we had with a, a food systems dialogue in a mining community uh, we held the dialogue designed by the primary school children and by working with the children to design the dialogue we, did, we found two things that might be valuable to you. The first is you, you create a safe space because the people you want in the dialogue are helping to set the conditions within which you have the conversation and this works at the level of children, it works at the level of smallholders, it works at, at, at global levels as well. But the other thing that it does is it brings different people into the dialogue who enter into the 
into the conversation with you in a different way to if they've just been invited to come and talk with you. They've shaped something that they want to be a part of. So I would, you know, I would commend to you as a way of running local dialogues particularly, working with a small design team locally from people who you would want in and say, well, how, what do you want to talk about? Who, do you, who needs to be in it? What would make it okay for them to come and talk with us? And I think you'll get a very rich um, flow of information if you start to do that, and you'll get that really owned by the people who are involved in it. We might come back to you in a few minutes for you to reflect on what was the outcome of your dialogue. Not now, because you might want a couple of minutes to think about it. Carlos Dora, please. Uh, uh, thinking uh, that I'm referring to the Carlos parallel Dora with... used to work at WHO. That's why I know his name. Um, the parallel with the IPCC may not be the best, uh, because you're really talking about conversations, about perceptions of different groups, and about narratives, about... So uh, I, I, I do think that you're underselling. I'm, I'm sorry, I think I praise a lot the IPCC. But it has a very strong, you know, scientific, natural science bias, and it doesn't have enough of the, the human science of the social sciences. And I think that the exercise has a lot because of the need to hear from... Uh, from different groups, why their perspective is, etc. So I think perhaps finding a, a, another, uh, I think better, uh, what you're doing is, seems to be much richer uh, from that perspective. You, I'm sure you will have the science. But there was a science of agricultural futures and development from, led by the World Bank in the early 2000s. And you know, the science and technology innovation has had some space at least. And I don't think that necessarily the, the, the narratives have had. And thinking of that, I think there's a number of methodologies, and the purpose is not uh, insist on that, but that you know, in terms of hearing people who amplify voices or you know, having different mechanisms for listening to different groups, who I think would be useful to incorporate, and you might have thought of that and have all in, in your plans. But I think there's a number of ways that you can hear different groups, and I, I certainly think that that would be a, a, a very a rich uh, way of going so we can get to behaviors and to uh, more of the demand side, as well as the, the production and, and uh, input side. Carlos, uh, please don't assume anything where our ears are so wide open and we do want to hear, to hear ideas about what you believe might work. So John's suggestion, any suggestions you've got, don't hesitate to drop a line if you would like. Sir, vous parlez en anglais, français, espagnol Bonjour, bonjour tout le monde, je parlerai en français. Oui. Eh bien, si, si vous parlez en français, moi ou un autre, on a quelques gens ici qui sont très bien en français, comme Brenda. On peut okay. faire une traduction, mm -hmm. so on écoute. Parce que c'est peut-être un peu difficile pour tout le monde d'avoir les oreilles avant que vous parlez. Ok. Mais vous, vous commencez peut-être... Vous arrêtez pour deux secondes pendant les gens mettent les oreilles et je vous appelle après tout le monde en les oreilles. Okay. Who else wants to speak? Mm -hmm. Stenica, can we get a microphone? Could you just lend your microphone? Prêtez votre micro à cette dame-là, le micro. Ah bon. Et on, on, on vous appelle dans, dans euh, peut-être trois minutes. OK? Yeah, does it, yeah, it's on. Thank you for giving... Attends trois minutes, monsieur. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. Donc, euh, je m'appelle Jean-Claude, je viens de Madagascar et je travaille avec une organisation nationale qu'on appelle ASOS. Euh, ce que je veux dire, c'est tout d'abord, je remercie les intervenants tout à l'heure les panélistes, c'était très bien et je pense que, comme mes collègues, nous adhérons euh, totalement à ce euh, dialogue. Euh, je vais vous parler de quelque chose que moi, personnellement, j'ai vécu, mais ça, c'est vraiment un dialogue avec la communauté, au sein des communautés rurales, où j'ai travaillé dans la lutte contre la malnutrition dans une zone côtière de Madagascar. 
Donc, euh, on avait fait la promotion, la surveillance pour la promotion de la croissance, euh, la sensibilisation sur la nutrition, sur les groupes d'aliments, sur l'allaitement maternel, etc., etc., pour euh, combattre la malnutrition dans les villages. Et au bout d'un moment, on avait constaté qu'il n'y a pas assez eu de résultats. Donc on avait commencé à faire le, le dialogue avec la communauté. Et c'est là que ça en est sorti, par exemple, que les maires qui disent « Hé, hey, docteur, vous nous avez appris à faire des démonstrations culinaires, à manger ceci, à manger ceci, mais ces aliments-là ne sont pas disponibles chez nous. » Il y a les, les hommes, parce qu'on avait inclus aussi les hommes dans le dialogue, qui disaient que comment voulez-vous que nous ayons tout ça, que nous améliorions la nourriture au sein de notre ménage, alors que notre rendement agricole est très faible. Et c'est vrai que le riz est la principale culture vivrière dans la région, et avec la technique archaïque, technique traditionnelle que les gens utilisaient, le rendement était à une tonne par hectare. Donc c'est alors que si on utilisait les techniques améliorées comme les cultures en ligne, par exemple, ça peut être multiplié à trois fois ou même à quatre fois. Donc on a discuté, on, fait, on a fait le dialogue ensemble et c'est là qu'on qu s'en est sorti que vraiment... Vous n'avez pas besoin seulement de techniciens sociaux, animateurs ou de médecins, mais vous avez aussi besoin de techniciens agricoles pour vous apprendre à faire de la culture, d'autres cultures qui que vous ne cultivez pas encore ici. Donc, on avait regroupé les, les maires et les, les paysans et on avait fait des dotations en semences au départ dotation en petit matériel agricole et on avait affecté des techniciens agricoles pour leur apprendre les cultures maraîchères, pour leur apprendre à améliorer les, les cultures euh, vivrières. Et ça, c'est au bout d'un certain moment, on avait rendu compte que le taux de malnutrition était fortement, a fortement chuté dans la plupart des villages où on a intervenu. Donc c'est un exemple concret pour l'importance de ce dialogue. Donc, je vous remercie beaucoup. Que vous avez trouvé au niveau local et que vous avez fait une très très bonne exposition de la valeur du dialogue local. Et on peut euh, prendre votre exemple et le mettre dans les autres niveaux aussi. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Claude. Merci and beaucoup. Thank you for that. And, and if we can build on that, Stinica, any observations you've got from your position as the, in the uh, Standing Committee on Nutrition based in Rome? I think based in Rome. Yes, we are based in yeah. Rome. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, in fact, my, my comment or maybe question relates to how this relates to the uh, Committee on World Food Security. In your introduction, you mentioned this these dialogues could or should feed into the deliberations yes. of the Committee of World Food Security. But when, when I listen to your explanations and, and the contributions of, of the other panelists, I, I did see quite a lot of um, almost overlap with what the committee tries to do. I mean, as you know, the committee has entered into food systems and nutrition since the second international committee uh, conference on nutrition, trying to overcome this fragmentation in uh, addressing the food systems and nutrition issues. So in fact, it is stepping into that gap. It's gearing up its, its efforts to address these issues. And the committee is or claims to be the most inclusive space doing so. I don't say it's ideal, uh, but at least it's, it's trying to be ideal. And it's even trying to go from global to regional to country level. So there's so many comparisons to what I see here. So that's my comment. So my question is then, how would you prevent that overlap? Or, or do you already communicate with either the secretary or the chair of the Committee on World Food Security to ensure that, well, 
this, is, this, this food system dialogue is not stepping on toes of the committee. Well, can maybe I you can you, help can me Can I answer there. you direct, even though it's, uh, I've said five comments and then remarks from us, but I am in contact with Mario Arbello, the chair of the Committee on Food Security. I invited him to come and be part of our group at the Stockholm Food Forum on the 13th of June. And he, I sent him also this little slide set, and he said this is, uh, in his view, helpful because it could contribute to some of the evolution of the Committee on Food Security that they're working on. I think that if, if anything that we're involved in in any way undermines or weakens that particular delicate but very important mechanism, then it's wrong. So I think your advice is very good and we've got to make sure that it is actually contributing to the strength and the survival and well-being of the CFS as an inclusive mechanism. Uh, thank you for that and uh, I hope that Mario Arvello doesn't mind me quoting him but uh, I, have, I am in touch with him uh, for that, exactly that reason. Uh, others, please come in with any... Yes, please. Yes, um, if food systems... Uh, and, uh, uh, want, sorry, uh, Marita Johansson, uh, UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. If dysfunctional food systems are... Uh, actually threatening uh, humanity and the survival of the planet, then I, I think it's great that these dialogues are happening and that they're bringing in so many. Um, but I also, and I also think that it needs to really bring in a time frame uh, for when these so-called catastrophic scenarios might be happening. Um, and and uh, don't we then also need to really um, make sure that there's, uh, or try to promote action alongside the dialogue and really make visible um, when these uh, worst case scenarios might be happening and what can we do to, to prevent it? Because I think we've really reached a point, if, if um, food systems are uh, such a major contributor to climate change, and if a transformation, as we've heard, is needed within the next 10 or 12 years, um, or else we won't, uh, we won't reach the, the, the climate change objectives, then, um, then I, think, I think this needs to really be made visible. Uh, we need to do everything we can to get this uh, up on the top of the global agenda. And we need to um, start having, uh, promoting real, uh, transformative action quickly alongside this dialogue um, if it's right. if, if we're to make Mary, difference. Thank you for stressing that. Uh, I will ask the panelists to comment in a minute. They, I'm sure, will have views on what you've just said. Thank you. Can we go on with any comments? Mm -hmm. We'll try and go as long as we can and then at um, just before eight we'll stop for some last words from the panelists. Uh, Merit is my... Yes, but of course you can. It's, uh, just, uh, Thank you. And I was if you could keep passing the microphones around, and when they yes, madam, yeah, okay. She, she For, uh, quick, quick question. I was intrigued by the the grassroots name. discussion. Sorry, Marie Durling. I work here at the Sun Secretariat. Um, my question to you is linked to my background, uh, where I worked on child rights and and, and citizen participation. So. Picking up on some of the things other people have said, um, I worked previously with trying to facilitate, along with a number of organizations, citizen um, dialogues at the community level and then try across the world, across many countries, and then trying to filter that up to platforms such as the World Health Assembly. Um, and the experience that we had there was that although you work with lots of local organizations, uh, you kind of need some kind of structure to filter the information and try to kind of initiate the process. So my, my first question was around, will there be some kind of secretariat, some funding, some core structure to just coordinate and kind of initiate these things and, and, and filter the information through, especially if, if, if really going down to consumers, grassroots, smallholder farmers. And second question is, because we're thinking at food system for the future, 
What about the participation of children and youth? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Bienvenue. Thank you. Uh, my Are you name going to speak English or French? Uh, English. Come. Thank you. Uh, my name is Funke Mbolujoko. I'm uh, recently retired from WHO. Uh, I, as I was thinking, looking through the value chain of the food systems, we know uh, the food processors uh, form a key part in trying to prevent post-harvest losses. Do you see this dialogue, you know, helping to maybe uh, get a middle point between food processors and health? Because as, as, as much as the food processors are trying to prevent post-harvest losses, nutrition-wise, we are seeing some of the things they use affecting health. Do you think such a dialogue could help to resolve some of these issues? Thank you. I think, I hope so. Sorry. Please pass on round. Who else would like to speak? Thank you, Funke. It's good to see you again. Thank you. So I think the point that you made earlier about some of the previous processes that have looked, tried to filter up dialogues from the local level up to the global level, I was quite involved as a youth activist with the Rio dialogues, which was perhaps not so successful, partly because they didn't really capture the sort of, they got a lot of voices involved, but they didn't capture the granularity of that because they were captured, had so many voices kind of contributing to that. So how are you going to make sure that you have both an open process, but also that you capture the detail of having such varied and kind of different voices participating. And then the second question I wanted to touch on was how you're going to you know, build up the trust with some groups that are really can be very sensitive, such as the sort of people's movements, the social movements, particularly in Latin America, and having had a ex previous experience when working for a donor on them not viewing a process around nutrition as legitimate, how you're going to ensure that they participate rather than walk away and feel safe to do so, but also, um, you know, actually do participate and give you the kind of voices that you that do need to be there and do need to be present. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, what's your first name? Mike. Mike, thank you, Mike. Mike is going to pass the mic <laughs> to <laughs> you. Brenda. Hello, uh, my name's Brenda Killen. Uh, I'm the incoming uh, director of the uh, Sun Movement Secretariat, so I'll be joining here um, 16th of July will be my start date. At the moment I'm working at the OECD, um, and uh, as this is a safe space, I thought I'd expose my ignorance. Um, I've been brainstorming in my own head, so I'll see if I can offer just any observations um, on this from, from experience at OECD. And partly, I thought to do this because of the work that we did on climate change. Um, and I, I do think there's some strong lessons to draw from that process. And, and if I think about how downcast everyone was after Copenhagen, um, and, and the engagement by cities was really was, was a huge thing. And I think because at, at that level, um, uh, cities could actually see climate change affecting them more immediately, particularly those you know, that would, would suffer uh, catastrophic floods or, or um, you know, the, the ones by the sea. Um, and, and just examples there where the cities engaged with the rural areas nearby to buy environmental services. And I think you know, there's a, a good parallels that could be drawn here. Um, I think the um, engaging in these dialogues uh, and, it, I mean, demonstrating that this is a political issue, these are electorates, people who will, will speak about these issues, I think particularly the issue around childhood obesity. I mean, I've seen in so many areas where people will move, they'll accept a lot for themselves, but they'll move when they think their children are going to suffer. And, and that, you know, hopefully, it's, I mean, it's not, you don't want to hope for child, childhood obesity, but hopefully something like that will help get people to change their mindsets before we see such catastrophic issues around, uh, uh, around food. Um, but then, what do we do in response? And a, a lesson I've learned at the OECD is that behind the scenes, while the politics are going on, I mean, first you need a, a, some champions who can move things globally. And France did so much in the lead up to COP21 um, to, to enable us to pull things back from the brink. Um, 
but also somebody needs to be beavering away behind the scenes on the policy trade-offs. How do you handle the politics if you're, um, you know, if you're in government and you know that this is unsustainable, but how do you deal with the fact that there'll be people out on the streets demonstrating because they're losing their jobs? So both matching the kind of demonstrating that this is a grassroots political issue that electorates want to change food systems, but then enabling the politicians to be able to respond to that because often things, um, they, they, they don't fail because of the technical arguments, they fail because politically there's no obvious path to handle the trade-offs in the short term. Wow, thank you. Who else? Yes. En français? Oui. Euh, je suis à la Larsac, je suis de l'Office national de nutrition de Madagascar. Euh, il n'est plus uh, discutable qu'il qu est essentiel d'intégrer uh, uh, tout le monde dans le la dialogue sur le système, uh, sur le système alimentaire. Mais ma question c'est que uh, comment uh, mettre autour d'une table ou comment intégrer uh, deux de populations de catégories de population de vraiment des systèmes alimentaires diamétralement opposés parce que si, si je prends le cas de Madagascar il y a des, des une, une partie de la population où on commence où on devrait commencer à se soucier de, de la perte à la consommation de la de la le, la, le, le mode le mode de consommation avec le le fast-food et, le, et les, les aliments, disons, à, à, qui, ne sont pas, euh, qui ne sont pas vraiment euh, nutritionnellement parlant bonnes, euh, mais en quantité. Oui. Mais il y a une autre, une autre partie, une autre groupe de population où ils ont du mal à trouver de quoi manger avec le, la condition climatique, avec la sécheresse et l'inondation. Donc, il y a des, des insécurités alimentaires cycliques tous les, tous les ans. Comment, mettre en, comment concilier tout la, cette situation pour avoir une, une politique unique, une politique nationale pour le système alimentaire Thank you very much. OK. Everybody, unfortunately, we are near, really near the end now. Uh, but this is exactly what I was hoping would happen, that we would receive suggestions and comments, and particularly tough questions and comments. Um, Osman, did you want to say anything yeah, very quickly? Think, uh, yeah. sort of about one of these sort of 45 second wrap up. Yeah, I mean, first of all, this is a, a fantastic conversation, and, and I really hope that come the Stockholm Food Forum, we will replicate that, this kind of a conversation among a bigger group uh, um, and that we can carry on uh, the momentum. Uh, I would just like to quickly uh, make a short comment to uh, Carlos's point on you know, the IPCC as a metaphor. Um, um, and, and I think for, for us, it has been an avid um, advocate of, of creating evidence or science-based targets that can set the urgency and, and set the targets for, uh, for when the action needs to happen. Because if you don't have that, then the legitimacy of those um, uh, arbitrary dates that you set um, um, are questionable. So the IPCC is actually just a metaphor of, of a success story from the climate change uh, community, uh, which managed to um, uh, come around, um, uh, I mean, I would say a very complex question, but still managed to get uh, build over many uh, decades uh, a consensus. So it should be looked upon as a metaphor when, when we use that. So, so the inclusion of young people um, and, and specifically also the gender perspective, I think, uh, is quite important and dear uh, to us. Um, and, and I hope um, uh, that building on the food system dialogues, I mean, it is a process, uh, mm -hmm. it is a start. Uh, it won't be perfect the first time, it won't be perfect the second time second time, but we hope that it will become an integral part, um, uh, or these groups will become, or these issues will become an integra integral part of the food system dialogues as, as it progresses in time. Thank you, Thank you. Usman. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, this, is, uh, this has been very good and great input, and I, I learned a lot. 
and uh, and I think I mean thank you to the Sun uh, movement for creating this space because it is that sense of a movement which Sun very much understands that is going to be important uh, about this in terms of creating uh, a, a, an agenda around that and and also I'll just come back it got mentioned. Uh, the, I don't see also from where we sit, we actually don't see the dialogues doing anything. So it's not going to become an IPCC or anything like that, even if it was the right thing. It's more that out of the dialogues, hopefully there will be some clear consensus around pathways for action that people can really move around. And if that happens to be, and I've just come from Montpellier where the Foresight for Food have been actually trying to bring a lot of the work together from a lot of the research institutions to say we need a much more coherent answer to your question. And, and actually I see a number of these platforms feeding into, whether it's Foresight for Food and a number of the academic institutions and what they're doing, whether it's the Food and Land Use Coalition or different partners eat, feeding into that that knowledge feeds into specific outcomes that can be uh, addressed through the dialogues. And so to your point then, you know, and, but it won't actually be doing those things itself. I don't thank know. you, Sean. Peter Backer. So uh, I want to thank my younger brother for putting us in a circle. Uh -huh. Because it completely changed the energy in the room, so thanks for that. I think, I think the tricky thing about system change is recognizing that everything that everybody has said is important, that we need to find ways to talk about the interdependencies and have peace with the fact that we cannot solve everything in one go. And, and please come and help with that. because. Asking questions to David or anybody else on how are you going to do this, how are we going to do that, how do we reflect this voice or the other, it's not going to lead to the answer we all need. So everything is important, we can't fix them all, but let's get us started. Thank you very much. Can I just therefore thank you all, it just to, uh, to Marie, you are absolutely right, we need to really skillful way to help support local dialogues amongst people who perhaps may not normally expect their ideas to be fed back, uh, structured to coordinate and, uh, and back up, will be there, but we will come to ask you for help. To Mike, the uh, Rio Dialogues, your, your, your thing, how do you capture the granularity when you're trying to aggregate? We need your help on that. Uh, and. Uh, I think it was you who said that. And then how do we work with those who won't trust and will not be part of it? Uh, there are people who will not be part of it and we have to accept that. And it's no point in, uh, if, somebody, if people say, really we want nothing to do with this, uh, then there's nothing we can do about that except keep the door open and it will never close. Uh, to Brenda, Engagement of cities, very good point. Gerda Berg made that point as well. To uh, Funke, about her point about really working with the farmers, absolutely. And I'd like to talk to you about that afterwards. To um, uh, yeah, Brenda, uh, we, uh, engagement of cities, yes. Uh, but the really difficult question that you said is how will you pursue what is thought to be right whilst at the same time helping the politicians who are having to deal with vested interests. The dialogue is about creating space where people can articulate the difficulties they have with their trade-offs, and that will be a key part of this work. Um, and it was the point, um, I've forgotten who said it, it's important, yes, from Madagascar, Monsieur a dit, Qu'il faut qu'on en a un moyen pour intégrer les communautés qui ne sont pas bien nourries dans les dialogues. Oui, absolument. Et il faut que peut-être vous nous euh, donnez la vis, comment vous l'avez fait en Madagascar, et spécialement les gens qui sont affectés par le changement de climat. Again, I would like to talk to you some more about that. And uh, I think that those, uh, yes, the point that younger people um, and obviously women must be involved well taken i mean i think the most important remark to say is that we're trying this 
collectively with you if you don't feel that these dialogues are something that has meaning for you then it is a mistake by us so please stay in touch and uh, I will make sure that any comment that comes to me via the Sun Movement or direct that we respond to it and we try to keep you informed. Khada, would you like to say any last farewell words uh, before we leave your lovely room? Uh, yes. Super late, I know. I'm always uh, happy to say a few words. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here because some of the uh, friends in this room tonight uh, um, we're here already during breakfast or for breakfast, so you have a, a long day, but it also tells something about the attractiveness of organizing these kind of uh, meetings where people uh, are involved, are invited to speak out, to contribute, and where their voice uh, is heard. Not that we have instant, instant uh, solutions uh, on the spot, but it's important to build such dialogue um, in a coherent and collaborative uh, way. And I think and I hope that it also will count for the, for the food system. Of course, uh, the food system dialogue will not uh, continue to, uh, to uh, bring every, everybody uh, on board all the time. At a certain moment, you need to uh, have a focus. But we, as Sun Movement, will be, uh, are involved. We will continue to be involved. And we will uh, work with our, count our counties to see what the best moment is to introduce it in their counties, because that is where it has to uh, be implemented with a focus on people leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, have a f safe trip, and you're invited outside. There is uh, some drinks, and there is uh, uh, some snacks, some finger food, and then have a safe trip to wherever you stay tonight, and see you tomorrow or. Tomorrow.